Some cop goes by the book and they charge you with attempted murder. You hear me? Attempted murder, then what? Then what? So he shot you! You just gonna let him fucking get away with it? I told you that's my business, not yours! Well, you're a fucking hypocrite. All right, cause every time we watch Godfather, when Michael Corleone shoots those guys in the restaurant, those assholes who tried to kill his dad, you sit there with your fucking bowl of ice cream and you say it's your favorite scene of all time. This is one of the most significant conversations in the entire 86 episode run of The Sopranos. Tony's picking his son up from a police station after AJ was caught trying to sneak a knife into the psych ward to kill Junior. In addition to foreshadowing Tony's death at the end of the season by referencing that scene in Godfather, this also represents the culmination of years worth of character development between father and son finally coming to a head. By season 6, AJ is a boy in turmoil over his inability to become a man. He wants to be useful when Tony is shot and hospitalized, but the only way he's been taught to respond to trauma is through anger and self-indulgence. He's gotten mixed signals from Tony his entire life, and all of his friends treat him like a social curiosity based on misconceptions they've picked up from gangster movies. This confrontation is essentially what Tony and AJ have been building to since they shared that look from across Jackie April's funeral back in the first season. But that's not all it is. I think this is also one of those moments where Chase, or whoever wrote the scene, is speaking through one of these characters directly to the audience, and to fully understand why, there are some things we need to go over. The Sopranos, more than almost anything that's come since, is the kind of show that rewards and indeed even necessitates multiple viewings, the nature of the storytelling being such that you can watch any given episode half a dozen times and come away with half a dozen different interpretations. But I do find there is a certain baseline understanding that anyone analyzing the show needs to have a zero point that we all need to synchronize our moral compasses to before we can effectively hear what The Sopranos has to say. Namely, we're not supposed to identify with the mobsters. Which isn't to say you can't empathize with them, it's hard not to. They're all three-dimensional characters that the writers and actors spent a lot of time and effort bringing to life, but a lot of the show is about emotional manipulation and how it can play off our humanity. When Milfi says in the Blue Comet that she's been charmed by a sociopath, I believe she's actually speaking for the audience that's fallen in love with Tony and the rest of these characters. What you need to understand about The Sopranos is that the show is responding to the cinematic portrayals of organized crime that came before it, where the mob is depicted even into the Scorsese era as a kind of romanticized alternative to the monotonous horrors of suburban Americana. What if, God forbid, it wasn't just vandalism? What if an employee, even the managers say, was assaulted? Look, every last fucking coffee bean is in the computer and has to be accounted for. If the numbers don't add up, I'll be gone and somebody else will be here. It's over for the little guy. The tagline for The Sopranos should be that there is no honor among thieves. Few of these characters have any principles that survive conflict with their own self-interest, and everybody's baseline motivation always turns out to be greed. I am your soldier, Antonio. This is my duty, like we're always talking about. The way this went down, this is my call. I got about to finish myself. Clipping a famous rat would put me a cunt hair away from being made. This is a show all about hypocrisies, of people and of institutions. Look at the FBI. Agent Harris spends the first two thirds of the series trying to lock Tony up. Then he's transferred to another department with a different assignment and suddenly he's willing to help Tony get the edge over a rival boss in exchange for information that will help his career. Even going so far as to compromise another agent's investigation. I love this little detail. All through seasons three and four, Agent Cicerone's male colleagues keep making these sexist little comments behind her back, but then in the end it's Harris who sleeps his way into career advancement. He hooks up with the agent working the Phil Leotardo case to get information, then passes it on to Tony. Phil Leotardo got popped. Damn, you're gonna win this thing. This was what actual FBI agent Lindley DeVecchio said when he was informed of Colombo soldier Larry Lampese's death in 1992. DeVecchio himself was later indicted for providing information to hitman Gregory Scarpa that led to four murders during the Third Colombo War and is suspected of helping Scarpa cover up other crimes, though nothing was ever proven. I've seen some people argue that 9-11 caused Tony and Harris to band together and cooperate out of patriotism. If you or any of your people ever heard of anything going down, uh, Middle Easterners, Pakistanis. You'd be helping us a lot if you, uh, you let us know. 
I think there's a word for that. Your daughter takes pre-med classes in New York? She uses tunnels? This is what I mean by people not getting The Sopranos. If you take one thing and one thing only away from this video, let it be that the show is extremely critical of white social conservatives who treat women like animals and blame their crimes on immigrants and racial minorities. Who else? Huh? Who else? We're not meant to identify with the Soprano family politics any more than with Tony's gangster lifestyle, though the show is saying something in presenting the two as interwoven. You gotta realize the administration's busy though too, handing out non-competitive building contracts to their friends. Hell, we can all understand that. Now, I don't think I'm being controversial in pointing out there's a certain, let's say, misogynistic subset within the Sopranos fandom that might have a problem with this particular reading of the material. Actually, you know what this reminds me of? The very first thing I ever uploaded on this channel was a test video I made teaching myself how to edit in Pinnacle. Sadly, it was a test I failed, I still use their software, but the video itself was the scene of Syl murdering Adriana while all the creepy little comments people leave about it pop up. Typical fare, a bunch of people saying Syl should have raped her before killing her, a bunch more calling her a rat or saying she deserved to die, one guy said Syl should have preserved her head in formaldehyde and used it as a masturbatory aid, and my personal favorite, I wanted her to have diarrhea and poo on me a lot. <laughs> I bring this up now because a whole bunch of people on my previous Sopranos video really seem to take issue with me calling Adriana the most innocent character in the series. Some going so far as to compare that to Holocaust denial, and I, I don't even know where to to begin with this shit. Eh, what can I say? Everybody loves a guilty woman. There's this comment I often see when a person is hurt or killed by an abusive partner that she knew or she chose to be with that person. I feel there's a kind of unspoken addendum to that statement which goes, and not with me but that's the subject for another video. Adriana's innocence, or lack thereof, and people's obsession with it are two different issues and should be addressed individually, if not separately. When I called her innocent in the previous video, I didn't necessarily mean that in the legal sense. Yes, she helped cover up the stabbing that took place in her office, and she does hard drugs and is technically an accessory to some of Christopher's crimes, but those are strange things to fixate on as being indicative of guilt in a show full of actual thieves and killers. I say innocent because aside from being one of the only characters in the series not to habitually victimize others, Aid sees the good in things. In a show full of cynics, she believes in happy endings. His brother runs a prep school someplace for young boys. What's more, she frequently experiences the blame for things she is literally innocent of. Christopher beats her for an affair with Tony that never happened. The FBI entraps her because of a murder someone else committed. You know, we put you guys on the mailing list for Hazelden. Hazelden? What's this? It came for you in the mail. Recovery? She never hurt anybody, and she's the one character where it doesn't feel like she's getting some kind of comeuppance in the end. Probably the most heartbreaking scene in the series, in my opinion, is in watching too much television when she's looking at herself in the mirror and still trying to feel excited about getting married even though she just found out spousal privilege won't get her out of the trouble she's in with the FBI. Her being killed for a traitor is yet another of the Sopranos many tragic ironies because her fatal flaw in the end was loyalty. Staying with Christopher after he beat and stole from her over and over, telling him about the FBI. FBI and then coming back to him again even though she knew it probably meant her death. Did you catch this line in the very next episode, by the way? I can't even get down the milk, spend some jewelry. Consider how coercive and predatory the FBI are with Adriana and compare this with how Raymond is handled. So, what's he saying? The way I remember, he said, uh, that's why you got the top tier positions. This other inaudible is crack fucking heads, not legs. Uh, depressed and what? Depressed and ashamed. So what about my Alan Stewart shirt from that meeting? Ralph Cifaretto spilt my coffee and ruined it. I can petty cash it. I love how helpful he is. I heard she took off. Any idea where? How should I know? He's a dope addict. Did I already give you that? And am I the only one who remembers Tony himself was a rat in the end? If I was to know something possibly terror related and uh, help you out, could I bank the result in goodwill? Well, what happens is, I would personally write you what's called a 5K letter. Say, a document setting forth your cooperation and service. 
this letter be placed in your file, and if you were ever convicted of a crime, it would be presented to a judge when uh, he or she would be uh, considering sentencing guidelines. Ladies and gentlemen, Hashem. He sells Ahmed and Mohammed out to the FBI, despite Christopher swearing up and down they're not connected with any kind of political violence on the off chance that someday it might benefit him in some insignificant little way. And he does it for the same trivial, bigoted reasons that always lead people to sell out their neighbors. Well, there were a couple of guys, I don't know, Arabs, Arabians maybe, uh, a week or so ago I'm driving and I see him with these other guys. The headgear and the beard and the whole fundamental bit. But there's nothing illegal there, right? What were they doing? Walking. We're not meant to identify with Tony and Carmela's politics, and we're definitely not meant to buy into the justifications these guys use to rationalize their crimes. None of them follow the rules, and they all turn on each other in the end. Adriana wasn't a traitor, she was one of the only characters in the series not ultimately out for themselves. All these little wannabe mafiosos who call her a rat and accuse her of choosing the life. Elliot, please, huh, with the terminology. Or who I'm referring to when I talk about people not getting the Sopranos. And I think it's who the show is addressing in that scene we opened on. Jesus Christ, AJ. And you make me want to cry. It's a movie. You gotta grow up. Ah. Uh...